first workshop of the day is going to be conducted by Mr. Bright Mawudo, who works for Dimension Data in Kenya. He's going to be talking to us about or conducting a workshop about evolving threat landscape adversary tactics and combating with threat intelligence. Uh, hi, Bright. Can you hear me? How are you? Yes, Welcome to Reem. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so I'm just going to tell the audience a little bit about you. Uh, and then you can prep. Uh, you already have your screen share started, so you're good to go. I'm just going to tell the audience a little bit about you before I hand it over to you to start your workshop. Thank you so much. Sure. OK, so uh, Dr. Bright is the head of managed cybersecurity services at Dimension Data East Africa. He's the founder of the cybersecurity collective Africa, Africa Hackon, the first ever live demonstration cybersecurity conference in East and Central Africa. He has over 10 years of professional experience in the cybersecurity industry with strong expertise in cybersecurity strategy building, resilience, and system penetration testing. He acquired a PhD from IT Convergence and Application Engineering with specialization in information security from Pukyong National University, South Korea. Bright has also presented at over 130 cybersecurity conferences, lectured at various universities, and contributed to cybersecurity publications. He was selected as top 40 under 40 2016 of young entrepreneurs in Kenya and worked with world-class organizations such as Cellulent and Ushahidi. Dr. Mawudo has performed various evaluations and selections of cybersecurity tools and has successfully implemented IT security systems to protect the confidentiality, availability, and integrity of critical business environments to curb and mitigate risks. Technically highly skilled in various environments, especially in the cybersecurity space, and he is a dedicated team player with excellent leadership qualities. So once again, Bright, on behalf of Rochester and the reInvent team, a very warm welcome to you to the conference. With that, I hand the stage over to you. Over to you, Bright. And uh, just to let you know, the uh, participants will be interacting with you over the chat. So if you're sharing screen, you may not be able to see that. So at the end of your workshop, if they have any questions, uh, I'll redirect them to you. Right? So over to you. We're looking forward to this interesting two hours. OK. Actually, I have two machines that are on right now, so I should be able to see some chats. And um, I will be asking for some information from a few people uh, as we move on. So please feel free to be able to get information to me or chat me um, when I ask for questions. Okay. So I'm going to be talking about, yeah, I'm going to be talking about uh, evolving threat landscape adversary tactics and how do you combat that with threat intelligence. So would be to be quite interesting to just see what are the new ways that hackers are trying to use to be able to compromise you. How do they get into your organization? How do they get to um, to basically try to, to uh, compromise you? And what are the latest ways that you can use threat intelligence to be able to actually stop this from happening? So just to look at uh, the cyber threat um, landscape or when challenges that we see when uh, our challenge assumptions secure digital infrastructure, we can see the cybersecurity is no longer um, just about defending the perimeter network, which people used to think about. Um, cybersecurity needs to adjust to the dynamics of businesses, and cybersecurity breaches cannot be accepted as a new normal. Some people are trying to take it that way, but that should not be the case. We also see the cybersecurity should be a proactive and predictive rather than the reactive. A lot of people like to wait until they get hit so hard before they actually wake up. Um, part of Dimension Data Group, where I work, um, the, our parent company is called Entity, Nippon Telegram and Telephone. And uh, Entity Group came up with some of the statistics of global findings in the last report. Um, so adversaries, adversaries that continue to innovate, remote code exploit execution is, is, is still there. We've seen injections, attacks accounted for 25, 29% of all attacks. People still have all vulnerabilities that are still a target, and because we'll see some of them today. Uh, attackers are still focusing on vulnerabilities which are several several years old. So you wonder why people still have SQL injection uh, vulnerability waiting on their on on their sites. You wonder why people have uh, simple cross site scripting vulnerabilities that are coming to the site. Um, and technology leads to attack in the industries. Um, that's the industry that we've seen a lot. IoT devices that continue to be uh, compromised. Um, if it's not for confidentiality's sake, I would have logged into a few IoT devices to, for you to see today, uh, where you can actually put off people's uh, shower, I mean, water heaters, you can actually open curtains, you can open their gates all the way from here. But we'll see, maybe I might show a few of those. 
Um, the content management systems have been targeted. A lot of e-commerce websites, since every, especially during COVID-19, everybody is trying to move all the way to the internet. And what is happening is that they are being able to um, have, to have those content management systems being compromised easily. Other security statistics that I've been seeing is that a breach takes a minimum 86 days to get detected and about 111 days from intrusion to containment. So people take a lot of time before they actually be able to see exactly what has happened. 27% of organizations encountered what we call a CEO fraud attack in the past 12 months where they're getting targeted phishing attacks that come to them. They get compromised on their Office 365 or G Suite or anyway, where redirection of their of their emails are being done, and a man in the middle attack is being is being done to actually compromise them. What I've seen in the past, um, just actually, but a few months ago, somebody lost a million a million pounds just because of a clicking of a link, and they are, and that got him to that got his Office 365 to actually get compromised. So there are various ways of things that are happening, and CEOs get to be a targeted because they hold the crown jewels to some of the accounts. If you look at uh, the financial system, they have to be approvers of, 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 um, of payment, for example. They will approve and send it to the finance department to be able to approve any kind of payment. If those content of the document changes or the, the content of the approval ERP system has changed, they get to be the one to, that's why they're getting to be targeted more. 74% of cyber professionals say that the organizations have been impacted by a global cybersecurity short shortage. That's what we see that a lot of a lot of people are trying to actually get to train more. But the thing is, the demand for cybersecurity skill set is always going to be there. And not everybody, and people need to start learning how to diverse. So, so the diversity is what is really most important. Um, and also we're looking at 75% of the attacks that are coming are coming out of emails, emails, email attachments. 36% will be malicious pop-ups and a website. We're going to see a few of them today. And 19% is unpatching vulnerable software programs and others are removable media. Um, removable media might be seen not to be, a, to be gaining that much traction because a lot of people are not focusing on that. But looking at an unpatched system of vulnerable programs, people still leave default passwords or credentials on their servers. They leave text files on their servers. I'm gonna show you a few of those today again. We'll see how can we actually be able to get all those. So. Hackers are using trusted email attachment traps, which actually helps to get them to get into organizations. Now, nobody actually ever thinks they will be a victim to a cyber attack until it becomes, until it happens to them. So they get to be hit and then they get to wonder, how did I get hacked? How come um, we did not try to cover all our tracks? Some of the gaps that has been identified in organizations is vulnerability and patch management. Majority of people don't do vulnerability management, whereby they're scanning the systems every now and then to know exactly what to, where they try to protect. I mean, trying to find out the various vulnerabilities that are out there and how do they even patch them. Patching doesn't mean that you're supposed to patch immediately when you see a vulnerability, but you have to rate the criticality at different levels for you to be able to plan how you're going to patch for the next few weeks or few months. Some of them might have to be done immediately, Others have to be tried in a, in a, in a test environment, in a, in, in a staging environment before taking to production, because you can't wake up and just go patch a production environment. We're looking at lack of endpoint detection and response, and I'm gonna touch a lot more on that later. An EDR or endpoint detection and response is way more than a traditional antivirus, where you're getting more insight into the, into the applications, more insight as to exactly how are you get, how are people getting, um, how is the malware trying to get into network? And it sees behavior, not just like a traditional um, anti-malware solutions, uh, but we'll get to see that later. Um, when understanding the right frameworks to implement, a lot of people wake up and say, hey, let's get ISO 27001, where they don't even know exactly what I, that ISO 27001 is supposed to entail. However, they need to start looking into the fact that there might be things like NIST framework being applied or COVID-5 framework being applied, which touches both on governance and the technical aspect of things before you even start going into, into ISO 27001. So people need to understand the right frameworks to be done. A lot of insufficient skill set for cybersecurity team, um, not easy because people, a lot of cybersecurity teams that I see get too swamped that they don't even have the time to be able to learn anything new. It's quite difficult, it's not an easy thing. Or as you get older and we see teams are getting, um, uh, 
smaller or they get a, a whole lot of work to be done by it's been done by one person one security engineer taking care of an entire organization of 500 endpoints having so many systems has to research doesn't have all the information becomes quite difficult that's why it's good to actually outsource some of those services if there is a need we see situations where there's inadequate threat intelligence um, which is going to be touched on like, get a, a bit more because you have so many systems you have too many devices you have a you have, i've seen net networks who have cisco they have checkpoint they have uh, um, fire eye or they have even um what uh, 40 nights and 40 sims and the likes all of them in the environment but they're not talking to each other so it becomes very difficult for them to be able to get the right intelligence to know what is moving in my network what is coming in or what is leaving people see a lot of traffic coming in but they don't focus on what is leaving the organization what kind of privilege access management do you have as you're all here right now who is logged into your system what are they doing do they have privileged access what commands are they typing will they be able to change zero to one or, or a thousand to ten thousand to be able to get uh, to change the entire organization and defraud you do you trust everybody in the organization that you need to have adequate threat intelligence a lot of organizations also don't have secure de application development life cycle even to integration or deployment so because that is not written down there's not been the thought process have not been put in place it is quite difficult for them to be able to know exactly how do they get to do um, adequate, um, I mean, uh, to do a secure application development to follow the process. Third party in engagement integrations, everybody's developing an API these days to make life easier. Everybody's trying to have connections from one place to the other. Everybody's trying to integrate their, comp their company or their applications to a third party to make easier um, access to things like payments. However, if you don't actually have that secure process of being able to make sure that the entities are talking to each other properly, you'll find out that a lot of people are getting to be hacked easily. Um, if we get time, I'll try to show you what, what happened. One of the APIs getting exploited. I'm not going to go too much into that, but I'll show you um, that people get to be exploited so easily because of API keys being left out or they don't have mutual authentication connection between the third party entities. And integration was done so casually that anybody can get access to it. Last but not the least is what? Adequate, it's, it's a general stuff, uh, cyber resilience awareness. Everybody, you just need to click, you just need one person to click a, um, a link in the network, on in, in a corporate network or open an attachment Get access to that person's machine and do a lateral movement through the entire network to be able to gain access so this is some of the gaps we have seen summarizing that the top watch of things that we need to look into is threat detection secure device management we're looking at enter monitoring of the entire network and seeing exactly what is coming in what is leaving and we're looking at vulnerability management as well so areas that we need to focus on is inside the threats i put that in red because that is one of the most focused areas that I see. People inside the organization know the details of how the network is, how systems are. They know exactly who is, who does what, what processes go where, who's a maker, who's a checker in the entire organization. So you have to fear in, 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 inside the threats more than external. We're looking at email security, biz, email security where we have to see a business email compromise, taking care of that. Anti-malware solutions should be, should be taken out and moved to EDR solution. Secure VPN and control. Um, yes, working from home these days, which almost everybody is actually getting very comfortable with. <coughs> Sorry. Got very comfortable with. They're using VPNs to get into the network. However, if somebody compromises your router or comp compromises your VPN in the house, they might be able to actually get an access to the entire organization. Um, active monitoring and incident response, actualizing timely mitigation controls. You've been hacked right now. Who do you call? How do you actually get to make sure that you're off that hack? Or how do you make sure that you don't spread that kind of malware that has gotten to you into everybody's other machine? Incremental cloud backups. A lot of people don't actually, I mean, this digital transformation that came um, right now because of COVID-19, for example, only came because a lot of people were not actually ready for it. They have the strategy written on paper or actually documented, but they have never ever tried them out. And some of those were basically it's cloud, cloud data backups or business continuity being activated and have some, some sort of strategy alignment when it comes to, to, uh, to making sure that they actually work. 
the supply chain of attackers have changed. You're not facing people who just create malwares and the likes and, and, and just mere hackers anymore. It's an ecosystem of people who actually know where they're going to, what they're going to do when they have to hack. A person will be the one to do just initial reconnaissance. You'll be getting one person just to do the exploitation of a system. You get another person who is just writing malware. And, at, and this ecosystem of people even have people to cash out. So there are ways that the, the whole entities are becoming, uh, the, the, the attack methods are, are getting to change. And we need to actually make sure that we can understand them. Some of the things that we see hacking, or we're talking about um, all the online kind of hacking and the likes are changing also because these are some of the tools people are using. Every single tool you see on the screen here, I have every single one of them, I bought the entire kit. And I try to just play around. This is not even the entire suit. I have a, a few more. On the left is the Hack5 kit, which allows you to be able to do very small little things when it comes to red team or blue team um, exercises. Um, so there's a time when I, so if one of them is the rubber ducky, it's in a bash bunny um, and the likes. What they do is to be able to actually act as a human interface device, plug into a network or anybody's PC and be able to actually exfiltrate data very easily. I was tasked to hack um, a, a bank in, in here, right here in Kenya. And the easiest way for me to do that was to actually profile the entire company. A whole lot of reconnaissance that got you know who works there, the front desk lady, who is the head of IT, how many employees are the various branches. And I chose one of the branch. So one of the branch, let's call it, one of the branch was in the, in the central business district, CBD. And I went there asking about loans. So they took me to various board, took me to one of the boardrooms. And I look at the boardrooms from because the glass door they had, I was able to tell which boardroom had um, um, any kind of video conferencing facility. That was for a particular reason. So I knew the name. And later, I, I faked an email. I'm going to show you that today, how, that, how easy that is. I faked an email from the head of IT to the front desk lady saying, three people are going to come from this company. Uh, please let them wait for me in the boardroom um, name ABCD. So, Let's call the boardroom um, reinvent. Let's call that boardroom reinvent. But I did got the IT manager out of the office for another meeting really far away, somewhere that I know he's not going to come back. I got it close to his office, uh, close to his home. By the time he comes back, it's a Friday, Friday afternoon. He will not come back to the office because one, I knew he was Muslim. He has to go to the, uh, to, to the mosque. After the mosque meeting me uh, for that meeting, by the time he comes back to the office, it will be too late. The traffic is crazy at times. So that was done. I got in that meeting with somebody. They were they spent two hours after his mosque session. And at the time I got into the organization, I faked an email from him, like I said, to the front desk lady. And the front desk lady, I've gathered a lot of information about her. I know she like she she the person who likes cats. Um, I know a person she likes to go to to for, go for trips, road trips and the likes. So I struck a conversation with her as she waited for that confirmation for me. And um, she's like, okay, yeah, this is in the boardroom. That boardroom that I sat in had the video conferencing facility. All I needed was a LAN cable and I put one of the devices in there, let it, I let it stay there, had a little bit of power supply to it as well and hit it. The entire weekend had access to the entire network, was able to scan, see, saw vulnerable machines, exported the Active Directory, from there, took a, did a lateral movement, found another machine, which was which was a Windows Windows Seven machine by a third party auditor, one of the big four auditors in the in uh, in the world, who were doing an audit in the network. But since that machine was exploitable, he had um, root access to the core banking system, but he was using a very unsecure network. So being able to scan the network and did uh, a man in the middle attack was able to get the password. Logged into that server, got the call banking system. It was the next day was going to be payday. So we actually got ourselves authenticated into the HR portal, added ourselves to the network. I mean, the, to the to the to the, the human resource the, um, and then the ERP system. And we got paid a salary the next day. Anyway, that was the planned attack. And we actually asked for it. That's why we, so there was a cleanup that was done later. Just because we wanted to show from a red team expert perspective, how far can we go that nobody will actually get to know? How come nobody in the blue team or that on that bank was able to know that we were scanning the network heavily from an external VPN source in the network? All the tools that we've been using were supposed to be picked up. That is why I'm talking about threat intelligence that needs to come in 
to be able to determine how these things are happening and be able to stop them. This watch is called a de-author, can actually de-authenticate you from a Wi-Fi and be able to connect you, or even spoof fake Wi-Fi for you to be able to connect to. The crazy radio, why well, use the use the crazy radio in an attack and it that work perfectly. Um, wanted to send a command to one per, a person's computer in an organization. And the only way is to get one person to actually open that link. Um, for the fact that I couldn't get the person to plug in a flash disk into the network, into their computer, uh, I had to be able to hack the mouse. So the crazy radio was able to intercept the traffic between the mouse and the computer. They're using a wireless Logitech mouse, send a command as a DLL. So it was running as an administrator on the person's machine. That gave me access to my VPS on, on, the, on the cloud, and I was able to log in. Hacking that person's laptop, run as persistence script, so I was able to stay in the network for a very long time, no matter how many times they restart the computer, it still gets me a connection back to my command and control system. There's the USB Ninja, which is very popular right now. There's actually one from Hack5, which is easy to program, allows you to be able to send a command to anybody's computer which are even about, about 50 to 100 meters away where you can trigger anything. So basically this attacks works when you go to offices or a target, you give them your phone to charge for you. This will actually show your phone charging. But the thing is that entire cable has Wi-Fi, has been reverse engineered to allow any kind of connection to come in. So with all those, the phases of attack is, is basically taking a lot of time to do reconnaissance. That can take days, can take months. For that red team exercise that I did, it actually took me a long time for me to be able to gather all those information. Uh, a long time, it was a week. Um, to find out with the knowing that I, I sent phishing links, trying to get to know who they are, trying to get to understand the target, what technology do they use in the network, the system. It can go as far as you go into the bar, a, a, a club or a bar where they're drinking and be able to actually get information about that. Because I have done that before. Then initial exploitation is not being able to try to compromise the attacker. Of course, when you get to compromise them using the weakest link, quote in quotes, because everybody is a weak link, but you just have to find out who will be the easiest to use in the organization. Establish persistence that you want to stay in that network for as long as you can. Install other tools, disable antiviruses, disable firewall defense mechanisms that are there. All of those can be scripted. Then you move laterally because now you have a foothold in the network. You can actually take time to move around the network and move around the systems, see what artifacts can you collect, what can you be able to, uh, to exfiltrate from the network and exploit further, which can take a lot of time. That we have seen a lot of those issues happening recently um, in the news, and I'm so sure all of you have actually been seeing them. So I'm gonna take you through a session of, of just a deep dive into what happens in the hacking world. Um, most of you might be familiar with some of these tools. Um, maybe you might not, but it's okay. We're here to learn. So I'm going to take it very easy uh, and I'll go step by step. So. So the first thing anybody, any hacker would do is to go to the site Google, google.com is ideally is a place where you can get almost anything and everything you want. Maybe sometimes we don't use Google as best as we're supposed to use. If I was to type, um, I mean, where are, where are the audience from? Uh, could anybody just tell me which country they're coming from? They can type in the chat. Anyone can type in the chat where you're coming from, where you live. Hello. Check the stage, okay. uh, wait, the stage chat, not the event. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> Both, it's the cross both. Yeah, I can see that now. From Malaysia, from Netherlands. Great. From India. Okay. So, 
All right, that, that's, that's some information I like that there. So we're gonna just take random countries. Um, feel free to send uh, details, even an organization name. Anybody can send uh, the name of their of their company. Um, let's just see what you can do uh, as a way of being able to get um, just basic intelligence or using open source intelligence to be able to get information out. So Google is powerful. That there's something called Google Docking. Um, you can search about it. There's so many commands that you can check. Um, the first place you can you can get most of those commands is called the Google Hacking Database. Um, but I'll just show you a few commands that you can get from there. So if you say Netherlands, uh, for example, Netherlands uh, website end with I believe is what N I N L. So if you go to to NL, I can say that if I put, say, sorry, okay. If I put, say, site NL file type doc and say resume, this basically says that I want to search every .NL website, any Microsoft Word document that has the word um, resume in it. and you're not stealing, you're not you're just borrowing it, a few details here and there. Um, so you can specify this to particular people and you want to get to find out exactly um, what they're all about. Uh, so you see resume of people if you want to. Um, so the NL is just to see, uh, wait, let me see. So this person's um, resume is publicly available or somewhere deep rooted in the website that we can actually use that his information about him. Um, so this is just basic information about people. You can specify that and say you want to look for, um, say, I can say Don Dyer, and Don Dyer is in India. I can see. I want to find out if there's any any webs any from every Indian website or India website. Um, I want to put together. I think I should put that into inverted commas so it puts them together. I don't know if I'll get anything, but this is to, to specifically get detail from people all over the entire world um, or just information about them anywhere. Google is so powerful that if I was to put, say, same thing, let's say um, India, say put password, and I put the extension to be TXT. I'm looking for text files that have the word password in them. And you'd be surprised that people actually leave password files all over the world and let's see it's a whole database that is out there and yeah people leave their server files with passwords in them allowing you to be able to log in um i don't know who this is i don't know where that is but um this is vfs look global okay and this is this are very latest files 2019 um people have their servers and their password is just out there again this is because this is basic open source intelligence of you just trying to gather information from out there um, about people's servers and systems and that is because of how they sell they, they set their, their files or the systems and you can be able to get all that information out if I was to go to say, um, I'm looking for, say, a particular domain that you want to find details about. So I can say in text, rochester.com, for example. I'm not targeting Rochester. <laughs> then we're looking for extension of, say, PDF. So I want to find out any PDF document that is available on Rochester website. So you can find the resources, you can find brochures and the likes, any kind of information. Google is powerful enough to say, if you're looking for movies and the likes, so index that of, look, I was looking for Captain Marvel the other day to watch it again. And you can actually see the back end of the website because of what we call direct to traversal, which allows you to be able to get all of those. So you could get, uh, let me see, this is not good there. If you see an index in the site, not a graphical user interface, you get direct access to the site instead of actually the front end that tells you to pay and the likes, the back end actually allows you to be able to download directly. So if you look at this, you can download the files directly, uh, but if you click on the parent website, 
you go a step level where you see all other movies and series you can think about. Um, same thing if you click the two dots and go back one level, you will be able to download anything and everything you want from that server directly from it. Um, again, you're not stealing, you're only borrowing because that's the internet and people have left their servers wide open for you to get almost thing and everything you want. If I was to say that I, I if you say I want to search in text, I want anything at gmail.com. Let's be just use the regular experience at yahoo.com or at hotmail.com. And I want a combination of all of those with the word account and password and Netflix, for example, an extension of the file is a TXT that I'm looking for. Let's say 2020, for example. It takes it to sites where you can actually get people's um, Netflix passwords. Um, again, you're not stealing, you're only borrowing. Um, and these are people's passwords. Some of them work. Uh, I don't know which one will work, but these are people's files. They've been hacked before in the past and somebody left all that file on the server. You can actually get all of that information for free. Same thing if you want to, you're looking for softwares, and I'm not teaching you how bad things work, but if you say in title and put a full colon index of, say, what, what software? Adobe Photoshop. I don't know. Photoshop. A particular version, you'll find that on most servers that are actually having that vulnerability. And you can download it directly from that server. So you're not, this is a mistake a lot of people make, but be careful. Some of them will be ransomware, so the likes, it could be clickbait. It could be bait for you to actually click on them or download them to your computer. So you have to be very careful, but that's basic open source intelligence that you can actually use um, to find out. One other type of uh, search you can use is to say file type. I'm looking for a text file um, and in text, I'm looking for the word Hulu, for Hulu, and, and I'm looking for anything with password or username being part of it. And you might find some Hulu accounts which have passwords in them for you to actually log in. These are just basics for you to be able to actually get uh, account details which are out there. However, I'll be more interested in being able to find out um, details about a particular company and say, I want to find out where do, who actually says they work at, say, Rochester, for example, currently. Oh, sorry, I made a mistake. And with this, this is just searching LinkedIn to find profiles. Um, yes, sir. Yeah, that's, that's just one dash. I can make a deal. If you look for the general manager, you want to find out who's in business, who's the IT manager. Content writer might be an easy person for me to actually go to because maybe that person's opened a lot of, of documents or files. Uh, sometimes you'll be looking for somebody who is in finance, for example, because you just want to gather basic information about them. Um, same thing if you want to, I mean, this is just using Google, but Google is so powerful to get access to a few details um, or use its search engines, other search engines like Shodan, which allows you to be able to see IoT devices. You can use Google as still to actually find cameras, live cameras for you to be able to log into, but I'm not gonna go into that. Shodan is equally as powerful uh, for you to see people's homes, uh, these are garages, um, which can specify exactly where you want to look into. For example, and these are all these commands are all available online, so you don't have to do too much to to find them. Let me put say India, I N, and only two cameras. Oh, three. Well, I was looking for a specific camera. Let's see, K R. That's South Korea. I bet there'll be a lot of them in South Korea. And these are so many cameras of people of which you can log into them without any credentials, just because you want to be able to actually search for details there. So 
that is basics of um, being able to get information about people um, out there um, trying to find out details. If I look at Rochester, for example, I'm not targeting Rochester, but I want to find out more details about who they are, exactly what do they do. Um, and what I'd like to use is use my Macaulay Linux uh, box just to find out details about, say, um, email addresses that they have. So I'll use something called the Harvester and say use the domain uh, is rochester.com or do we use GSK, for example, let me use GSK as Joseph Chandra has put. I'm not a robot, come on. So it's gsk.com. I want to first check the first 200 results of Google. The reason why I'm using the Harvester is just to find out details of how is how how is the GS how is GSK emails being created? What is the naming conversions? What can I use against GSK to be able to get a lot of information? So I'm not even going to go to the the subdomains and the likes for now. I'm looking at the emails. So there's possibility that I can see all the emails are first name dot the last name okay and first name x so the profiling will be so joseph chandra if i may guess your email if i get your full name it will be joseph dot a letter for middle name or x dot chandra that might be the email of of joseph chandra at gsk so getting to see this hackers usually send emails to group emails things like info things like recruitment for example because if I send an email to recruitment at GSK, somebody's going to reply. What I want to pick from that is the is is generally the um, the, the, the the how the email structure looks like the the um, what's that thing the signature at the bottom. That signature is really important for me to be able to get um, because it gives me a power to do things. Now, email addresses um, get to get to be an avenue to be able to send details to people are uh, in ways that we don't even know so if you don't mind anybody can share with me the gmail account for example in the in the chat anybody please i want to show you how some of these emails um, email exploitation can work and you can check with your own company and see if that 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 will happen to you but i just want a basic gmail account since i don't want to target a company Great. So Joseph Chandra, I, li I like Joseph already. He's, he's very given. <laughs> so it, emails work in a way that when you want to send an email from one person to the other, you will be able to. Um, it's basically an SMTP server trying to send details from one place to the other. That means if we're all in a, in a room right now in the boardroom or the conference room and I had a pen in my hand and I want to pass it around to the person at the back, Either somebody will pick it up and take it there, or I could throw it, or I could give it to Jason Chandra, who will be in front of me, and just put throw it to somebody at the back. Same way, there's a vulnerability which uh, is found in a lot of organizations where SPF and DMARC records are not done properly. You can check your SPF and DMARC records with, say, things like valleymail.com, um, where you can check to see the um, status of if your domain is actually protected or not. If I check for mine, brightz.com, you'll find out that you can't be you will not be able to actually spoof my domain because it's protected. I made a few changes to my uh, uh, SPF and DMARC records. Let me just show. Anyway, as that is working. So there's this little program that I wrote. I, I did a little bit of scripting, basically registered an API key with another, with, with, send, with send mail, and wanted to use that to be able to see if I can actually spoof an email from joseph.chandra at gmail.com. Um, I'll be sending that to maybe see myself. So I can send it to, I want to send it to corporate email. So say bright.gamely at africahackon.com. Joseph, what do you want me to say? Uh, so the email subject is um, approval of salary review. Kindly fill 
in the document attached for your um, salary review. I mean, if you're in an organization and you get that from the finance director, there's a very high chance you're going to download that file. So in a few seconds, I would like to, this could be done from most corporate emails. So as you can see, my email is protected uh, from my SPF and DMARC records. I'm going to check my email now. This is my Z. Oh, there it is. Before refreshing. So Chandra is with us in this chat right now, um, but I have forced an email to come from him. If he has this picture, it's actually going to show a picture of him on his um, on his avatar, making it look like it's real. Most of the time when you try to see, if you see this is sent via SendGrid, I can actually reply to him right now and he will be get, he'll get the response. Thank you very much. So in the next 10 seconds, um, John, Joseph, just check your email and see if that has come to you. Oh, actually shows this picture. So I believe he's checking right now. Do confirm in the chat if that has come to you. Okay, as he's checking, we'll move on to the next thing there. Ah, great. So he has confirmed that it's come to him. Assuming that I send that email from him to everybody else, that would easily have what I've what I, what I, what I've gone to would have gone out and people would have believed that it came from him. Email security will be able to be able to be some of the things that will look at to, to stop that from happening. But hackers want to get more details and, and they want to find ways to be able to entice you to click. I didn't attach any document to that. I could have, but it just would have taken a bit longer time. But I didn't have time to do that. But that can be done. Now, hackers will do another thing is trying to do a simple phishing attack which um, I will use the various um, phishing details here. So let's say next Fisher, for example. Uh, and all of these are publicly available, by the way. So next Fisher, I'll try to do maybe say Microsoft, and that's going to set up an Ngrok. Uh, let me use an Ngrok server that I don't have to necessarily have buy a VPS or anything. And what I'll do is to take that server, it will create a shortened link. Again, what hackers would do is they know possibly somebody will see this and be able to know the content of that. So, excuse me. Oh, Chandra has replied. So, ah, thanks, for I love the demo. So, thank you. So, they use something like they use either bit.ly, bit.bit.ly for a shortening link. And what I'll do is to put that link there, shorten it and be able to send it to Joseph Chandra if I was to send that link to him to open. But if I was to open that on the browser, this is exactly what you're going to see. It will look like a place for you to sign in on your Office 365. Today, I'm not going to show you how to bypass two-step verification, but again, it's possible. So this looks like a typical Office 365. If I was doing my reconnaissance and I realized that the company Office 365 has their logo, I would have to customize this to that. But this is out of the box. Where I can say Joseph.Chandra, for example, at gsk.com. Welcome to the demo. And when he clicks sign in, it actually takes him to account.live for him to reset his password. What is happening in the background is collected the IP address where I am right now uh, and picking Joseph's um, email account and then a password, which I just type say welcome to the demo. So that is one basic way of being able to actually do phishing attacks. And hackers are using various um, um, various easy accessible tools online to be able to actually do that. Another one that happens, which a lot of people seem to fall for, uh, or if I want to do is to use something called Seeker. Um, but there are so many tools you can use. Um, so I'm just going to use Seeker. i open another tab. But um, so I use. Python 3, Sika. We'll do a manual version, but I'll set up another Ngrok server. 
on say port 8080. And with this, the new version even has WhatsApp, but I'm gonna use uh, Google Drive. And I want to actually put a real Google Drive link. So what I'll do is have here, I have this, my first hacking tutorial I wrote when I was in high school. I found it the other day, so I just decided, you know what, why, let me not use, why don't I just use that? If I were to send that to you, it's a possibility that you might actually open it and it will give me details about you. So I can send that to, to the chat, to the stage. Well, first of all, let me put that here. And this server is being prepared and it says it gives me an ngrok server. So I will share this. I'll share this in the group. Anybody can actually click on it. But the easiest thing for me to do is to basically just show you how when you open that, it gives you access to say, it, I, it, it gives you this page asking you to actually give access to the, to the person. And I'm, I'm so sure you've all seen this before. When you click on request access, if it's an, a, a very enticing email, most people don't look at the details of what comes after. So they quickly they quickly just say allow. Um, so I know Joseph might be able to click on that. <laughs> Joseph, you can. If you click on it, just click on allow so we can see where you are. So this will give you the real detail of exactly where, where um, the file that I wanted to share. And if it's something that I wanted anybody to be able to, um, to get access to, um, you, are, you, you have to make it as believable as possible. So the email has to be crafted properly. And it shows the details here that of my machine, my OS, my platform, everything that I have, where I am right now, the network, the ISP, my latitude, my longitude. Um, this is another one. Okay. That's probably Joseph. And the good thing about such information is that when you actually see all of these details, you might want to find out exactly where the person is, uh, what are they doing, what machine do they have. So I'm going to pick this GPS location, for example. Let me stop my Hangrox server. And I want to go to find out details about where that person who clicked on on the file, I mean, on the on the link where they are. So I use the program called TW Location. So I put the latitude. just to be able to get information from him or wherever that person is. So that is basic information collection um, of about the target. Uh, and all of these tools are publicly available. Other things that you can do is to find out people, details about people's phone numbers. Um, I did this earlier on just to show details about if anybody wants my phone number, it's right here. Where you can find the details about the person's phone number, if it's a valid phone number, if it, is, it a, is it a phone that is, is it a throwaway line? Where is the person calling from? And all of these are publicly, again, available information. Last but not the least, when it comes to such details, is to use something called data exploit. So data exploit can find out details about, say, um, so let's say they want to do an email open source intelligence. Uh, sorry, and I'll say joseph.chandra at gmail.com. I don't know if I'll find anything, but let's see. Maybe he, it, it basically goes to search details about him on the internet, find out what exactly does he do. So with that Gmail account already, I can tell technical specialist, list, active there is, or what are his qualifications, website, we'll go find out more detail about him, his LinkedIn profile, Twitter profile, um, his email, Tentative CT is in Mal is possibly in Malaysia, and uh, does email exist? Yes. If I wanted to find out more detail about him, Chandra, that is you, I believe. That is basically just using publicly available information just to find a detail about him. Twitter, for example, also has so much information about people. 
Um, and I'm just going to show you one that I did some time back. I'll just show you the details of that. Um, and these tools, again, publicly available tools where you can find out details about people um, just by profiling them and getting more details about them. So this Tim Folick will be able to show you details about followers and friends. Um, I think it's been the, the project has been discontinued, but the old version still works. Uh, getting to know what does this person talk about, um, talking about URLs that he talks about a lot. This was about me. What, what time am I most active on the internet? You can find out all that about me. What phone do I use? I use Android. So if I'm going to create a malware for, for Bright, for example, I'm not going to use an iOS exploit. I'm going to use something which has to do with Android. Get to talk about who do I talk to about a lot? What does Bright get to, to, to interact with on the internet? Who? What are the subjects? What are the hashtags? And this can be done for a particular time, um, time span, saying I want to check between um, February 1st to February to February February 1st of 2019 to um, January 28th of of 2021. What, what is the life of this person on the internet? So all of this information gathering takes time. It takes um, careful understanding of your target to know exactly what do you want to serve him that to be to be able to make him click on anything that you want um, or details like that. Now, after gathering all this information, you want to be able to exploit him. So first of all, I'm just going to set up a small server. My set up my Apache uh, server and use basic Metasploit. I'm not going into an advanced kind of hacking. I'm using basic Metasploit framework. There's quite a number of frameworks that helped with with antivirus evasion. Um, and if we're to have, I mean, I didn't focus. I'm not focusing too much on exploitation methods. Otherwise, we'll see how we can actually get to um send fileless malware how are malware is being created these days to exploit targets so i'm going to put this on the side uh let me resize that a little bit so this is my command and control just a simple server and i have a target on the right here so the target usually, if I was to send Ch Joseph Chandra that file and he actually was to download it, I would zip that file and put a pa put a, um, a, a password on it that Google or cannot be able to to scan that file to see what exactly it contains. That the person will have to he have to download it to his computer and actually get to to um to to open it by using that password. Mind you, remember we said salary review. So I would have put content detail numbers here to confuse him. And because it's computation of salary, it looks so believable that I'll just say you have to enable content or enable macros for you to be able to actually get to compute that. Now, that already gives, just by doing that, um, I've served him a DLL file, not the traditional, um, a, um, how to call it, most AVs will not detect it because DLL exploitation is by passing a lot of antivirus uh, systems. Some of them can detect it, others not. If I was to do a fileless malware, this would have been hidden in a document, and you can't even see the macros. You can't even see how exactly it is that it's working or where it's calling from. And the file will be the executable file will be called from, let's say, a GitHub account, which is legitimate. So again, anti-malware solutions will not see that as anything malicious. If I was to interact with this in session four, and I want to go to the desktop, for example. Again, this is nothing advanced. This is just basics. Um, and I want to create a folder. Today, I'm using Joseph a lot. Sorry. I just had to use it because it's easy. Uh, I mean, you're, you're OK with me doing using your name, I believe. So you can see Joseph Chandra is there. Possibly, do you want to enable some sort of a key logger in the background? And it can use um, um, key scan start. And we are watching this live. And you want to close it, for example. And you can actually see what the person was typing. Just basic, again, if you are malicious enough, you want to shut down that person's computer, you can do that. You can listen to Mike in the background. You can listen. You can turn on the person's camera. 
Um, if there's a CD-ROM drive, you can open it. You can change the background. You can change almost anything and everything from the person's computer. So those are just basic ways of how um, um, hackers are trying to get into your network and systems. They just want to use basic uh, technology and find ways to be able to understand the target. Understanding the target is really important. Understanding that the, the corporate network they are part of their lifestyle. They do all of those for a, a targeted attack. Now, you've been compromised. Your network has been infiltrated. What are the ways of you being able to detect some of these and be able to stop them? There's so much we can talk about this for the next few, for the next ten hours even. But I'll try to summarize it as much as possible. If you, the maturity of any organization is to be able to have some sort of systems available for you to even determine exactly how what is going on in the network or systems you might have an IT team who can actually respond to issues most organizations i see are usually on level three minority of organizations possess platforms and structures to proactively address it issues and security challenges so they'll have a sim or some sort of um uh, even the anti-malware solution is centralized so a sim is a security incident and event management tool being able to collect information, intelligently process them, and I'm going to go so much into that again after this, and be able to process that to make sure that you understand what is coming to your network. But you get thousands of emails every day from the, and alerts from your from your SIM that you possibly might not be able to actually even check them. Level five of where you have a SOA is where we have to start going into, that it will automate and do security orchestration, automation, and response. So. Doing a putting in a saw and putting that threat intelligence together with the same is where we have to start moving from traditional risk management to a, pro, a predictive threat intelligence that we understand how is the posture of our organizations, what is coming in, what is going out, what is happening, which device is talking to what again, whose uh, machine is potentially being compromised that they don't even know. And I'm going to do, do a demonstration of that as well and show you how the saw works. So just as this quote I've said, you can get cybersecurity right 99% of the time, but adversaries only need to exploit that 1% to cause that tremendous change. So we need to understand, can we predict some of these things that will happen to us before they even happen? So we're trying to move from reactive approach to predictive approach that your time that you have to spend to recover is very short. That will change the cost of attack and the incident as well. So I always preach to a lot of organizations that I, 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 I try to change strategy for that your recovery time is going to determine exactly how your business is going to be in the next few minutes or the next few years. Why do we do threat intelligence? So threat intelligence uses machine learning to automate or to get all the data that it, it, it pulls from all the network and systems. That's processing integrated with existing solutions you already have. And it helps you to be able to understand the tactics, the techniques, and procedures hackers use or threat actors match it against what we call the indicators of compromise. And I'll explain that very soon. That those indicators of compromise, with all of that in information and intelligence, a human being cannot possibly do that. You use that to be able to actually prioritize your security activities, operational acti activities, formalizing your trash and incident response. You have to automate some of these responses because. You can't be the one to be compromised and you have to call your network engineer to say, hey, I've seen this, uh, this, this IP address uh, trying to hack us. Can you block it? Then he was like, oh, call Joseph Chandra to work on the Active Directory and block that user, the username, that, that user account because that person's account is going to be used to do some sort of passing the hash or password spraying in the entire network and it might be possible. Then you have to call another person to approve. By the time you get all of those approval and changing policies, it's too late. That's why we have quicker turnaround times we have to do with playbooks. And I'll do, I'll show you a demonstration of one of the playbooks that we have written in our, at our organization. And also prompting getting the right alerts, but contest for intelligent correlation. You want to separate signal from noise because there's a lot of noise that we get in our systems just to show that we have something, but we have to separate that signal from noise. Indicators of compromise or IOC that we call them is things like unusual outbound traffic on inbound traffic. You're looking at brute force attempts. I've seen that a lot of organizations um, that I've tried to work with in Kenya are people's account being brute force. It might be old school, but it's still working because if I collect every information about Chandra, for example, which I got from Twitter, from all of those details, I have a feeling his password might be something to do with something about him. And if you use something like CUP and the likes, a tool, a tool, a tool called CUPP, C -U -P -P, 
you might be able to actually have a dictionary file, an amalgam of thousands of possible passwords, and it might work. Um, because again, we're human beings. Organizations try to put passwords for systems with the name and have part of it being uh, 2019, 2020, 2021, um, make it as simple as possible, which they never actually pay attention to. So and, and the unauthorized file modifications, malware detection, privilege escalation, geographical irregularities. You can be in the office and all of a sudden your 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 account is being logged in from uh, from from Malaysia, for example. So behavior behavioral anomalies, active scans. If somebody has compromised your machine, like what I did with that bank, if you're scanning the entire network, an indicator of compromise on the SIM is supposed to pick that up. Mismatch port application traffic for DNS tunneling and suspicious registry file changes. All of those logs are being collected onto your machine, but how do you make sure that intelligence is being put out there to make sure you actually get the right information out? So as I said, I'll, I'll talk about the SIM. A SIM will be able to have log correlation, co collection, the correlation analysis of it, that's forensic investigation, um, that IT compliance, log monitoring, um, be able to report to you with the thousands of alerts that you have. You have a nice dashboard, which a lot of people like to have nice dashboard but exactly what are you doing with that dashboard with all the time that all the real-time alerts that are showing up on the screen do you have time or do you have a whole team to be able to go through all those alerts and see exactly what is happening um, or be able to drill down to exactly what happened to a particular entity this is part of a same one of the same and the, the details that is showing is multiple logon failures on a database 17,775 times that was not done by a human being either the application is erroneous or a human being is trying to brute force that database because this is just between a very short time and that's a lot of attempts. So this is where evolution meets revolution. Seams can take, you can you can check on your seam a particular incident and go through, go drill down to that incident, find out exactly what is happening. What is the indicator of compromise? Has it been successful? Has it been a, a, and across the entire network? What has happened? A saw that will take about 30 minutes. A saw, on the other hand, when you have written the playbook, will take just four seconds to be able to do that. Because the use cases that you build upon for a saw, a saw a playbook will be able to do optimization, threat monitoring and response, does investigation and, and hunt, threat handling, uh, hunting, and also do an intelligent management. So it collects all the information that is in the SIM or other devices, makes a decision to know is this actually an, an attack? Be able to do the triage and help you to respond and also give you some sort of context for for business intelligence for prioritization so let me just show you exactly um this is one of the saw that we or a playbook that we wrote um a dimension data we know that users in organizations are forever getting um hacked by the account being used maybe i can give you a little context um to to a situation that happened an it manager at one of the banks in kenya was being accused of his account being used to log into the mobile banking system, a simple server, and that uh, his account was being used on that server to process transactions because he was a checker. So somebody made, a, there's a maker and a checker on that system, and he was able to approve some sort of money transactions to so many accounts, uh, so many phone numbers. And the only thing that saved him from that prosecution was the fact that he was on a flight to New York and they couldn't now they couldn't actually blame him because he did not have any internet on the flight that he was using at the time and he did not log in and activities from his uh, of them of uh, on the logs when they drill down only showed that this actually happened from somebody inside so otherwise he would have been the one to be blamed for this kind of uh, activity this is a user called washira uh, logging into his active from on with his ad password um, logging into his, his his computer, and when he logs in, we can check to see his um, his IP address, um, just to do this demonstration. So when he checks his IP address, we can see it's seven one ninety seven. That's a typical password. I mean, IP address for him to be able to use. And um, but I was at eight twenty six. At eight twenty eight, somebody has compromised him with the key logger has his password and this is in a network one of his colleagues who is malicious enough has tried to actually log in as washira on his machine 
But when the person has logged in, they want to use, they are using a, a VPN to be able to see if they can mask their location that nobody gets to see the activities. So that person, for example, has logged in, has used the VPN, and when you can see, the IP address has changed to 63.141. It was in the frame, just two minutes. Now, that happening, the SIM would have seen that as an impossible traveling uh, kind of thing because the person has moved from the from a location in Kenya to another location in a very short period of time. You get an alert on your email or your SIM dashboard as an incident. And that might be part of the thousands that have come to you. By the time you even get to drill down to that particular incident and find out whose account was it, who was that was compromised, what IP address details, uh, you want to find out uh, the, uh, the enrichment of details of that IP address, that will take you quite some time. So I saw, uh, I saw that we wrote a playbook to that, that investigation have done, has kicked in and that has, has happened in less than eight seconds. And if we're to find out details about that person or that detail, let me just longer. Um, we said if that has happened, we don't get to go investigate too long, but let's disable that account before we even try to investigate. So when Washira tries to log in again, that account has been disabled. So that is a that's a whole process of automation that we're looking at. This is how the playbooks looks like trying to find the reputation of that IP address of the original one um, through virus total. Uh, there's other places you can check as well. Um, and trying to find, get an enrichment of the user that was compromised from each domain, which forest that is, is a part of, because it could be different uh, uh, location details um, and details about if an attachment was there in, in if, it, if it, a playbook can be open for phishing attacks that you've written, you can actually find out details about somebody's attachment, get, get to know exactly what is contained, do investigation, uh, find out location details before even taking action to that person. So this is just how a SOA looks like, um, finding details about people, uh, details of you being compromised, which a normal human being would have taken four hours to be able to do. A SOA would do this in just a few seconds. So this is just basically how it works. I don't know if we'll get to questions later. Now, moving to EDR and antiviruses. Traditional antiviruses are not going to work anymore. There are so many programs that are out there which are doing uh, multiple levels of encoding and they'll bypass the traditional antiviruses. This is why we have to move to what we call an EDR, which is endpoint detection and, and response. ADRs also have antiviruses that are included in it. Um, so it contains security tools like firewall, application wide listing. Um, and you're trying one way that I was trying to compromise um, some, I was, I was building some sort of a, a simple malware reverse engineering was to do what you call application bypass because your traditional antivirus will stop things like executable files, possibly, if it actually does not have um, too many encoding. Excuse me, traditional antiviruses will stop things like say, um, what, a batch file, for example, but it will not stop things like DLL, it will not stop things like WScript, it will not stop applications that are used every now and then. If you look at something like TeamViewer, for example, if your organization likes to use TeamViewer, TeamViewer actually uses things like WScript to be able to run in the background for it to work. That means application whitelisting can be quite difficult to achieve in most, organ in most uh, and enterprise systems. You can't block every single application and say you're going to stop them from um, actually running. So EDRs will be able to see behavior, trying to understand exactly the behavior of this application. And if it's a dropper kind of um, malware, trying to not touch the disk, but running memory, what you call a fileless malware, it will not touch the disk. That means your traditional antivirus, again, will not see it. That is why you need EDRs to be able to actually check to see where did this file come from, when it landed, or when the person tried to open it, what touched the disk. It could be a normal legitimate application that will open, but another one is running in the background where it has spawned another process. So we need to start moving to EDRs where we can explore file system, extract files, list processes, extract where logs, be able to process them, and be able to take action on those immediately without necessarily a human being be able to see that, oh, I have, an, I have a virus, but it has not been taken care of. Another thing that we need to do in an organization, which I like doing a lot, is adversary emulation. Um, so there are so many adversary emulation tools that are out there. Again, a lot of open source. Um, for red teaming, 
this will basically i know people do a lot of pen tests you do a pen test but you find a little thing here and there and you stop your uh, your activity so you start your pen test from actually happening adverse emulation will be able to emulate those tactics this is just one sample that i took uh which i was doing for a client i just wanted to see if i can find files identify active directory users and this will will test your response mechanisms to see on the blue team side of things is your sim be able to pick this up it's a saw that your playbook is able to stop some of this. I use this a lot to be able to see what traditionally happens in organizations and we can write playbooks for those. And is it also possible that you can actually determine some of the gaps that you have after trying to do a complete lockdown of your entire network? So there's so many um, how to call adversary emulation tools that are out there. Some of them you have to pay for. Uh, this is, a, I'm using Atomic Red, uh, Red Teaming uh, tool. This is free, it's also open source and it works for me, but I customize a few things here and there to make sure that it works for me. Uh, for example, uh, when it comes to AV evasion, I've, I've managed to just change a few things to make sure that I can use my own um, malwares that I create, not, not ex extremely good malwares, but just modification of processes and creating something that will be able to bypass that. That's on the corporate side of things. But what, what are some of the safety tips that we can look at for people who are not maybe, I mean, just to check for those who are not too much tech savvy, we can look at some of the safety tips to do every day when you're looking at your personal security. So try to create passwords that are a phrase um, because most password crackers don't recognize the, the space in passwords that we create uh, to be able to actually um, crack it. Once when, so when doing a brute force, a password with the space in that as a phrase might would much easier for you to actually stop uh it will take a longer time for anybody to brute force so for example the password is i am creating this password to be strong and you put your spaces in them then you can add the characters of the numbers and the likes to make it stronger change your password every now and then rule of thumb is every 90 days but i know some of you will be like i can't remember almost all passwords um i mean you can't change password every 90 days and remember them again they're human that's why you have password managers like LastPass, Dashlane, one password of which maybe I can show you one. This is my LastPass. Um, and if I open my LastPass vault, it has all of these passwords for most of these pay, um, platforms that I keep here. So all I have to do when I'm leaving, I have one master password, which is a phrase. I log out and I'm done. So in that case, I don't have to worry about um, what password I'm storing anywhere. Now, talking about passwords, the basic thing you can do for your email security is to have two-step verification, which a lot of people don't actually put on. So make sure you have your two-step verification on, but also have what you call the backup code. Because again, most people don't think you need to put this on. If you lose your phone at night and, and, and somewhere you are, there's a, very, there's a very high chance it'll take you another 24 hours before, or 12 hours or six hours for you to get your phone back. I keep my backup codes, one in the wallet or at home, that I can use it to be able to log into my, my, my device without a two step verification in case somebody is trying to log in. So somebody steals your phone, how are you going to get it back? I like to use various programs, like something like Severus app. Um, Severus app works for me easily, and it's only about $14 for three devices, where if somebody steals my phone and they try to put it off, I can get a picture of the person in my email, it alerts my wife immediately. You know, it sends the, the, the nearest base transmission station, and I'll be able to actually get to know how easily it is for me to actually find the person, track them down, lock things down, wipe it remotely whenever you get any kind of internet connection using a simple feature phone to send an SMS to that phone. So they can put the phone off, let's start from there, which makes it very easy. Um, there's a persona version, which is in case you want to send real time alerts to your loved ones all at once. Uh, for security's sake, or for your kids. Uh, I'm not saying you should spy on your kids, but <laughs> sometimes it's necessary for you to do that. So these are some of the ways for Severus app. Um, the Severus, there's, there's quite a number of others. There is another one called Prey and the likes. They actually, you actually have to log in before you can download to your PC, I mean, to your phone. The reason why it will be flagged as the malware by Android or anything about by the likes is because of the kind of permissions that it needs for you to be able to run. So please do actually have that downloaded, explore it, try it for two weeks before you buy. And when buy, buy it with this using like PayPal and the likes. So use it for, don't use information that can easily be found about you online. Um, 
We post a lot of details up online. And I think during COVID-19, we went a bit too far even. Uh, don't share your password with others. It's a very bad habit we have always saying, hey, I'm not around right now. Uh, are we away? Can you log in for me and do ABCD as me? There's a very high chance that you have used the same password for so many other portals that somebody can actually impersonate you and actually frame you for things you haven't done. Don't store your passwords online. Yes, I know Google uh, Chrome and the Lights will have easy ways for you to store the passwords there, but there's some hooking uh, browser expectation framework that will be able to extract those details out, which might be too easy. So I personally don't like to store my passwords on my browser. I use uh, my LastPass and I have two-step verification even for LastPass. Don't use part of your social security number, your national ID, your date of birth, and the likes when creating passwords. Typical thing that we do. Don't use wireless hotspots or wireless network when you're actually using doing very sensitive transactions. I like to hotspot my phone and make any, any kind of transaction if I have to, because um, being, on this, being on the same hotspot as the coffee shops you go to, somebody can be sniffing that traffic. Um, if I, I didn't create a very good network here, otherwise I was showing you some of the very simple tools that can be done. There, one of my mentees, he's 16 years old. I showed him a few ways of being able to spoof networks and the likes. And he actually wrote a script that will kick you off the original Wi-Fi, connect you to the fake one, which you want to connect to the coffee shop that you go to, and everything you do can be seen. All the traffic could be stripped up from HTTPS to HTTP. And if these kids can write such scripts, um, you can imagine what else can they do, and and he's 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 very young. He started I started with him, mentoring him when he was six, when he was only eleven, and the things that they can do right now is pretty amazing. There are tools and devices that are out there that can do it, but he was able to write his own scripts. So be careful about the kind of hotspots you go to. Use don't use public computers even at your friends. Um, some of the work you do are too confidential and too sensitive that you go to your friend's place and you log into their machines there's a very high chance you'll forget to log out or you leave it there because you're too excited about whatever is happening and you'll forget. Download legitimate apps on legitimate sources. Use HTTPS for sites. Don't open links that you're not sure about or where they come from unknown sources. And especially when they are actually zipped with a password, take a closer look. Understand exactly where it's coming from. Um, see where who, who is sending that email. Call the person if you have to. And then click on ads as are the one of the ways according to the statistics that i showed you earlier of how people are trying to get into your network and if you look at that i use adblock plus um it's simple it's free you can actually just download it if you google that of you can use to be able to actually block all these pop-ups from coming in um because some of those are the ways you're gonna get compromised um, on your network reduce the digital footprint um be selective of the information that you want to share on your in, on your on the internet and keep your personal information private. How this is very very important is that I I did some, this some time back. I was supposed to compromise again one of the really big organizations, and after final information about them, I know they use Office three six five uh, at the time. I need to find a way to get into his network. The head of IT is a person who is very boastful. He is very boastful on the internet that he's forever sharing everything he does on the internet. Because I don't, looking at his history, he wasn't too successful before. And now being an IT manager or being called IT director, he was very boastful. If you try to fight him on Twitter, he will actually shut you down by being very rude and everything, which was a good thing for me, information to have. He goes to a particular um, pub to drink on a Friday, every 5.30 to 6 p.m. He, that's the time he shows up because it's very close to his office. Um, that was according to the social media information I collected about him and his username. Um, and actually, by finding one one username of him, I went to what's my name dot app, and all I had to do was, for example, to say Bright Seed, which is a very common name for me that I use everywhere. And this goes to find out every other page that he has. I went to his YouTube page. I know what music he likes, so I knew that particular club was what the one he'll be going to. And he's always there. All that information that I found about him allowed me to be able to profile him. He likes tall, slender, light-skinned women, according to all the pictures he has on his Instagram. I picked that information up very nice and easy. And I took three ladies with me. Um, I knew he'll have to be attracted to them, one way or the other. Two are his type, one not so his type. 
And when we got there, of course, I, by mistake or intentionally rather, hit him where water poured, the, the water that was, the drink that was on his table, the water that was there as well, that poured on him. And he couldn't get mad at me because the two ladies already he's attracted to, he knew there's no way I'll come with three ladies and all of them are mine. I used that against him, social engineering, and I said, look, I'm sorry that I actually spilled your drink and the water. Uh, if you don't mind, can I buy another drink? It's an expensive club. Nobody just buys, no random stranger just buys to drink, but I bought a whole bottle because that was part of the budget. I bought him his favorite drink, which is Johnny Walker, because that was Johnny Walker is the drink I found of, according to social media pages. And we, I just let him drink. He drank so much. Two ladies said they want to get in internship with him. He gave one his email addresses, details, and said, send me your CV. And the lady's like, oh, she did her, her project, which was a program. Can she sign it as well? She sent the program as well. But he gave every detail about the antivirus we're using. So we actually created a malware and tested it properly to know that it can bypass that particular anti-malware solution. It was a while back. Um, and this actually, so we sent an email to him. He said, ah, in fact, copy my secretary. He's a boastful person. He has to show he's a very big boss. So they had two targets now. Makes it easier. The more the target, the easier the hack um, for that, that for that kind of attack surface. So we sent an email to him um, and the and the secretary, macro enabled. Uh, the secretary was the first to open it, clicked it, and we sent him the application that the lady has created, zipped with the password protector. So when he runs it, it actually opened a real nice program. And because he wants to give a very nice review for the lady to become an intern in his office, he went straight ahead. He is going to validate all the HR protocols and we got easy access. So now these are two people who gave us access to his machine. He actually has a, a text file on his desktop called passwords, which we wrote a script and got all of those passwords. We got that file downloaded and that gave us access to the biometric uh, system, the AD, the Office 365, everything. And their, their, even their, 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 their systems do not have a two-step verification activated. So it made our lives so much easier. That is because of basic social engineering and gathering information about people online. So other things you need to do, back up your files, Google Cloud, Microsoft, OneDrive, whichever you want to use. Keep your mobile and phone antiviruses safe, I mean, uh, updated. There's, there's Defender, there's, there's um, he said there's quite a number of antiviruses, anti-malware solutions that are out there that are a little bit more intelligent. One thing I like about ESET is the features of doing having uh, host intrusion prevention and then be able to also get it to browse safely and the likes um, and the likes. Um, so which made it easier for me. So I'm going to wrap up um, in a few slides. Um, we used to think about cybersecurity a lot, and that cybersecurity we used to think about was about protection, detection, and response. You know how to protect your organization, so you put in access control, IT awareness, data security, and all of those. You have anomaly, you have same tools and the likes to detect anomalies and events, and securing the continuous monitoring. You have way to be able to respond to those kind of attacks when they happen. Cyber resilience, on the other hand, is being able to identify some of these issues that might happen to you and how do you recover very easily. So be that includes asset management, business environment, governance, risk assessment of gap analysis and risk profiling, and then the risk management strategy. Recovery process is really important. A lot of people have a disaster recovery plan put in place, but they've never tested it. They have ways to be able to actually communicate to people, but they've never tested it. Test it out. For example, you're in the office, somebody has spoofed your Wi-Fi or your emails have been compromised. You can send an email to everybody and say, don't click on this link. That's why I did that before in my former company. What I did was an SMS blast. And I said, the policy says, if I call you and say, send this SMS, you immediately send to the entire company as a blast twice or three times. So when I realized our, our Wi-Fi was being compromised by somebody who was trying to hack us, and our emails were also being compromised to spoofing emails, quickly got the company to send an SMS blast, sent out to everybody, says, do not click on this link or do not check your email, do not connect to this fake Wi-Fi that is happening. And that was, an, a, that was a response, a recovery uh, and response mechanism that I had to put in place. So we need to think about these five elements when it comes to resilience, and we need to stop, stop thinking of just cybersecurity. Our mindset has to change and assume that you have been compromised. So you have to raise the attacker cost and rapid response time is really important, like I mentioned at the beginning. Make use of cloud technology, that makes it easier for you. Um, and also have the hygiene that you can identify all well-known risks 
and steadily burn down that risk. You can't, you can't finish, fin you can't finish securing the entire organization in a, in a very short time. That's why it's really good for you to be able to make sure that you can identify all the risks. That's what vulnerability management that I mentioned at the beginning is really important and be able to say you can actually manage and patch all the systems steadily and not just go burn down even your entire team. Uh, there's a burnout that will come. Cyber fatigue will be will, will actually rain down on you. So what are the key measures of the success of all of this when you do that for resiliency? Increase the cost of attack for the attacker to be issued, to make sure that it's very difficult for them to actually get to you. And you have a mean-time mean radiation is being taken care of as well. We used to design every single system we have to never fail. We can't be doing that anymore. We have to start to design our system to recover very quickly. Your DR site, how do you have access to them? What's the access mechanisms that you put in place? Do you have any privileged access management um, that can easily give access to people and you can monitor and lock them out when they're done? Your, your, your approval processes. We used to try to design systems or applications to, to actually stop every single attack. You can't. Hackers will forever be looking for new ways to be able to compromise you. You'll be looking for new technology and the likes to be able to make sure that they will get in no matter what. Um, with the APTs that are happening, you need to make sure that you assume if you compromise, that you can protect, detect, and respond along those attack phases to make sure that you're always safe at all times. So with that, I say thank you very much um, for engaging, um, being able to actually give me the audience and the time. Um, it's a Sunday on this side. I know some people might not be even on, maybe be online. Um, and I think I'll open the floor for questions. And yeah, this is how my office looks like in my threat intelligence center. Very nice, cool blue room. I think I designed myself. <laughs> um, I actually dreamt about it, so I decided to design it this way. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Wow, Brett, that was awesome. Uh, especially when you start giving us all the demos, yeah, that was truly an excellent session. I think everyone enjoyed it. That's so they're saying in the chat as well. Uh, we do have a couple of questions. Bright, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, we do have a couple of uh, questions. The first one is, uh, what kind of technique or tools do you use to stay invisible instead of tripping all kinds of alerts while hacking? Um, I basically, so one, I, I created my own um, VPS where I tunnel all traffic through that. Um, but another way is to be able to, I use um, a VPN. So the VPN that I use uh, most of the time is called ExpressVPN. Um, I like ExpressVPN because I, I, I had to make sure that the traffic is not being leaked out and and, and it's not free anyway. It's, 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 it's about a hundred dollars for the entire year. Because anything that is free, you are the product. <laughs> That's what <laughs> I realized a lot. Yeah. Uh, okay. The next question is: uh, How many attacks do you receive every day? Uh, on the corporate network, or for myself? But if it's the corporate network, oh, we receive thousands of them. Um, and actually, I use that to contribute to the national cybersecurity, just because for intelligence basis. Uh, myself, <laughs> I do get quite a lot of people try to do phishing attacks to me and the likes. Um, that happens at least twice or thrice every week um, because people are trying to get into my machine and the likes. Uh, so I have almost everything in cloud, my cloud backup. So even if I get robbed physically, I want to be able to actually get back to my my my, my machine. I mean, my sessions very easily. I'm yeah. sure the head of IT wants your information, doesn't he? Yeah, people want information. A lot of people. <laughs> uh, okay, the next qu question is, uh, can you find out uh, where or from whom WhatsApp phishing emails originate? That would be very difficult. Um, so I, I usually, in such investigations, I just give up on them. Uh, because you try to find out details about um, where it's coming from and the likes. Um, so usually what I use, if I want to find out some details about a phishing email or a, or a file is sent. I use um, Virus Total. So Virus Total has a place you can put a URL to find out if that's an efficient link, or you can put a file even if sent to you. All you have to just do is upload it there and then tell you details about that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the next question is: uh, What are the things you should be careful about while downloading apps? 
one um most apps when you download them it will ask you for certain permissions that you're not supposed to actually give so why for example would you have a flashlight app which is asking for permission about your location it has two jobs on and off <laughs> so it doesn't need a location to be able to do that um and i like i like going to the i i so those are some of the things you need to look out for the permissions that an app is asking for and sometimes this Permissions are actually in your in in, in uh, actually applications that are in Play, Play Store uh, or Apple Store. It actually takes a lot of information about you and be able to uh, take it out there. So you have to be just be careful about the kind of uh, permissions that you give um, applications. Um, that is one, and others will actually want you to download uh, details about. Um, sorry, I'm too download details about say no i don't want you to disable your your sources or your third party source to be disabled and it, it allows you to be able to install it as a normal app some of them even come in the form of whatsapp messages and the likes and um entice you to to disable third party sources and uh, that's you need to be very careful about that okay uh do we have any other questions okay there is one more when we download apps, it asks for fingerprint or location access. Is it safe? Something's uh, that asks you yeah, for it, location access. It depends on the the kind of um, app that is that you're using. Uh, so it depends. Some of them will need the location details. That, 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 so, like I said, if it's an app that does not need any location information, that don't give it to it. But fingerprint, that is just an extra security level, so which is okay okay uh do you use tools from the dark web and how do you know they are safe i use a few of them but how i know they are safe is i put them in a sandbox so i create a virtual machine that does not connect to my internal network or my main pc and i make sure that that virtual machine is updated because some tools can actually do what they call um, um a VM sandbox escape. So they actually escape from that virtual machine to your normal uh, network. Um, so I basically try to make sure that I don't um, allow that. So I use that a virtual machine to to actually, to just technically see exactly what this file is from and do a few reverse engineering on the app. If it's a script, I try to read the script entirely, see exactly what it contains, what is it fetching, is it fetching from a third party, and then I can monitor the traffic and see exactly what the app is doing or the script is doing before I use it. Okay, so there's a follow-up question now. Some tools that you tend to use can run into thousands and thousands of lines of code. So how yeah. do you go about manually or uh, reviewing every line of code to ensure it is secure or safe? Um, so I look at the traffic. So I run the application, but I see the traffic of what is leaving my, my, com my computer. Is there any call to an external uh, third party server that is not supposed to? Because some of those, ideally you can't read all of that code to understand even. So I look for keywords in the in the script, um, uh, which has to do with IP calls or commands that are going to actually connect to another server. Um, and if you do basic programming of Python and the likes, you'll be able to actually pick some of those up. Okay, the last question is, how far has hacking evolved since Stuxnet? Oh, it has it has evolved so much. I I think it has gone way higher than than you expected. Um, if you want to look, look at some of those, um, I forgot, it's a, it's a, it's a, some of the videos that have been going around showing um, the next level of hacking. It's on Netflix and the likes called is it, is it intelligence. It it has changed the phase of hacking and people cyber warfare is real and um, people are state sponsored hacks are not going to chill anymore. And people are creating more servers to be able to do that. We recently saw the one for Sunburst, which is now which is exploiting uh, solar winds to be able to use the DLL updates to be able to push to all the US government. That did not take a day or two. It might must have taken about a year or two years even for that to happen. And they steadily did that in a very systematic way. So cyber warfare can is it, is changing. Stuxnet was easy. The tools that I've shown you today with the Bash Bunny and Rubber Ducky uh, USB flash drives. Uh, was what status was being used. Placing flash drives on the way to work, people picked it up, plugged it to their machines. It was easy. Now, they don't have to even do that. They all have to make sure they can bypass the traditional antiviruses. People even now send uh, employees to go 
uh, or send their hackers to go school in another country, go to actually get a job in a particular organization, and they actually get through to the network. Um, so now that they're planting people inside organizations now. So it has changed significantly to say, Fred. Yeah. OK. So uh, I think uh, we're done with the questions. And that was really an awesome session, right? And once Thank again, that much. awesome. It's very awesome. I think everyone we got everyone very excited with that uh, look at the pictures that you have put. Uh, have a great rest of the Sunday, uh, Bright, and as always, stay safe. And we look forward to having you back for future reInvent events. Thank you so Thank much, you. Bright. That was very fun. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye.